Welcome to The Raise Podcast. I'm Carol Barwick. We're here to raise your confidence and inspire your creativity. Each episode, we will have a different guest who will be discussing our Raise Word. The Raise Word is a word that will encourage you or empower you and at times inspire you to explore the word a little more for yourself. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Raise podcast. I'm Carol Barwick. We are in season four of the podcast right at the beginning. And we've got a very exciting guest for our episode two. She does all things Eurovision, but is also a minister. And uh, we've got some really exciting things to talk about today. So can I welcome Lisa Jane Lewis? Hi, Lisa Jane. How are you doing? Hello. Hi, Carol. Yeah, good. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. I am very excited because anybody that knows me knows that I love Eurovision. And Mm -hmm. uh, I originally got in touch with you because I wanted to see how possible it was to actually um, enter a Eurovision song. Again, people that know me know that I've wanted to do that for ages. And people may say, well, that's ridiculous. But that's exactly what we're going to talk about, isn't it? Our word is ridiculous. And I really? love that. Yeah, it's a great word. And I think it's got lots of meaning. So I'm looking forward to kind of unpacking that with you a little bit uh, during this chat. Absolutely. So before we do all that, what does it mean to you? The word ridiculous means many things to me. And I think it has it has both both a positive and a negative connotation. And I really hold those two things in balance um, because I... I do appreciate how great the ridiculousness of of my life is and can be. And I'm sure we'll unpack some of the crazy things that I've done, or as I always say, the things that Eurovision made me do. It wasn't my fault. Yes, please. Um, (laughs) Eurovision made me do it. I love that. (laughs) Um, But I, but I'm also aware that, you know, to, to, to be ridiculous and to sort of identify as ridiculous as I kind of do, I do it a little bit tongue in cheek. But I'm also kind of aware there's a bit of a negative side to that as well. And it is, you know, it has this meaning of kind of a fool, somebody to be laughed at. Um, and I I really hold that intention as well. because I think you need to have a certain amount of kind of self-esteem and it's better to do what I do. But also there's definitely a, a kind of dark side to that as well, which we might unpack a little bit too. Yeah, know. absolutely. I was just looking at the meaning and there were words like derision mm-hmm. and, um, you know, silly and laughable and all that kind of thing in the negative connotation. But um, it depends how you see it. Right. Who decides what is ridiculous? Yeah, that's such a good, good way of thinking about it. How who is deciding the meanings of words? I think I always take it a little bit like. um like you know how Dolly Parton sort of has embraced this whole like yes I do look trashy and I'm going to tell you I look trashy and I'm kind of going to own it before you accuse me of it yeah so it's that kind of understanding that some people might look at what I do and go what is she on that is ridiculous brackets negative yeah and I'll just go yeah yeah it is <laughs> um, you know if I if I own that myself it's maybe a, there's a layer of kind of self-protection in that um as I I feel there probably is with with Dolly Parton as well you know I, I love I love her famous phrase it, it takes a lot of money to look this cheap um and <laughs> and I sort of kind of feel the same way about myself like not in terms of how I look but like it takes a lot of ridiculousness to be this ridiculous <laughs> love it and I think of all the the things that have really owned and embraced exactly what they want to be at any one time, it's a Eurovision Song Contest, surely. They just own the lot, don't they? <laughs> They're like, bring it on. Let's, yeah, let's just do it. Whatever it is you want to do, okay. <laughs> That's how it seems. <laughs> it's it's really interesting, and actually, you know, I can be I can be kind of nerdy uh, and and go back and look at the history of the contest a little bit just for a few minutes because it was set up really to kind of unify people after the war. It started in 1956 as Europe was recovering from World War Two, right. and it was also set up to enable broadcasters to share best practice, best technology, innovation. 
So that's why you've seen things over the years. And this really did start way, way, way back in the 1950s um, and, and has gone through the decades. We've seen kind of experiments in broadcasting take place at Eurovision because it, because it was set up as a ground to be able to do that. Yeah. So, it, and that's meant different things over the years, but in terms of things like color television, a lot of that was experimented with at Eurovision. Different ways to, to use cameras and use camera effects have all been experimented on at Eurovision. Um, one of the, I don't know if people have been to, you know, when you go to a football match or you go to a concert or whatever, and there's the, like that camera that flies overhead on these wires. You see yeah, it? yeah, yeah. It's called the spider cam. And the first place it was ever used was at a Eurovision Song Contest. That was where it's like testing ground for how it can be used. So I think what you're saying is, like Eurovision has embraced all this stuff because that's what's set in our DNA. We are set to be a testing ground, be experimental. And sometimes it can be a bit ridiculous, but they work because that's what the DNA of Eurovision is for. That's fascinating. I love that. I mean, last uh, last episode was about Wanda and we, mm-hmm. we were talking about how important it is to ask those questions well what if and and why and do that and it sounds like that was very much the ethos of Eurovision is well why can't we do it like that why can't we have a a a camera flying across to make it more exciting and right wow they won an award in uh, the uh, the Eurovision that was held in Moscow I don't know if I talk about that one now but um, they won a a camera award because they used a Segway you remember the like they were like very trendy they had camera like on a Segway that kind of went straight like all the way through the audience up onto the stage and round like they won an award for that camera shot because it was about experimenting it's about what's new in technology what can we do that no one else has done yet and where does that take the future of entertainment broadcasting? So things that have become standard place, moving cameras, sliding the spider cams, all, all that kind of stuff. It's all been developed at Eurovision. People just don't know about it. On-screen graphics, you know how you see in the corner of the screen now, you've got like, um, it tells you what the country is and maybe what the yeah, yeah, yeah. is and things like that. Yeah. A lot of that technology, that like um, on-screen, like layered graphicking stuff was all experimented at, at Eurovision and then it goes out to the wide world and people don't know necessarily where it's always come from. But quite a lot of it is is this kind of development at, at Eurovision of broadcasting technology. I'm being I'm being quiet because the questions that are going through my head at outbreak of knots, <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, I, but I think the biggest thing for me is that those meetings where somebody says, how about we do it on a segue must be so interesting because if you've got a different group of people, they would very possibly say, nah, that's ridiculous. Don't, that's not going to work. You can't put a segue through a massive group of people. It yeah. doesn't matter how amazing it would look. And somebody in the room has said, well, let's, Why not? let's try it. Oh, yeah. It's just absolutely my my heart. It's that kind of, yeah, why not? Have you ever been privy to any of those meetings or met um, people that you know are kind of really forward thinking in that way? I, I've never been privy to those meetings myself. My goodness, that would be uh, uh, incredible uh, and, <laughs> and ridiculous. Um, yeah. <laughs> I certainly know. Not, not least because they happened maybe 30, 40 years ago. So, yeah. But no, exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, but I certainly know some of the people that have driven the creatives, uh, the creative side of Eurovision forward. There's a there's a whole bunch of people who, who input into Eurovision. There are people who work year round on it. There are people who are brought in. It's a, a, a joint broadcast really between, well, it's the host broadcaster. So let's take Liverpool, for example, because that's quite a good example and people know it it's in it's in the uk so um the host broadcaster was the bbc of course last year they were working in partnership with uapbc which is the ukrainian public broadcast yeah yeah yeah. and you're also working in partnership with the ebu which is the european broadcasting union and eurovision has a reference group that kind of sit over top of that but that reference group is made up of tv professionals who have been executive producers of the show in previous years and and various people like that they yeah. work in 
entertainment television. So it, it is a bunch of creative people in a room and in many rooms. And, you know, from, as in all these things, you know, sometimes sometimes these ideas start off sort of on the back of an envelope kind of things. And you're, it is that, exactly that conversation we're just having. Well, I wonder if you could do this. What if you, what if you did that? Um, and I think there's a, another kind of way to explain that is when you look at all the competitive acts in Eurovision. So you have, we have 37 coming up this year in, in Malmö. Wow. There were, I think, 38 in Liverpool. Not sure. Hmm. Um, but it's usually, you know, sort of high 30s, early 40s, ar around the 40 mark. Um, and each one of those then has a creative director involved in it as well. Yeah. So if we take the ones that people will probably remember, uh, which is Lorene who won for Sweden and she was in a kind of box and we were sort of calling it the panini sandwich press because it looked like <laughs> it was going to come down and squish her into yeah. it. Into a, into yeah, it was like one of those torture chamber yeah, things. Exactly. Like, so like, <laughs> took the spikes out. <laughs> yeah. So at, at some point in a conversation in the Swedish television, somebody said, I wonder if we could put Lorene in a box that sort of slightly opens and you get more graphics the more it opens. Equally, Finland, which is the other one that people will remember, Karia with Cha Cha Cha. Yeah. Um, you've got, well, I wonder what would happen if we would have this like great big box built out of wood and we tethered our dancers to it. Could we do that? Could we do I don't know if we could do that. What about yeah. if he pops out of the top of the box and smashes one of the wood things out of the way? Let's give it a whirl. So you've got people in every country working on the acts themselves, as well as overall creative producers who are working on the overall look of the show as well as people who work in the interval acts who are working on everything it's it's a creative kind of melee of let's be honest ridiculousness and what you get at the end of it it's is amazing it it's <laughs> absolutely amazing uh i always remember i think it was australia that were on the big bendy stick yeah, so that was Australia 2019, Kate Miller Hyde Key with the song Zero Gravity. I was such a nerd. Uh, oh, but I, I was it. there. So I, <laughs> I mean, I am better at remembering the ones I was actually there in the room for and that I interviewed and that I spoke to. Um yeah, that was that was incredible. When um when they won in the national finals for that year, she wasn't on the, the they're called sway poles. She wasn't on the sway pole, she was just like on a giant step ladder with a great big dress and Australia the head of delegation uh, Paul Clark for Australia said kind of publicly his statement was when we bring this to Eurovision you're going to see something you've never seen before and those of us who are old hands and skeptical just went oh yeah we've kind of seen it all before like yeah yeah bring it on. really really <laughs> you've got something new and then they wheeled them on the stage <laughs> and the swaying and that I was like, <laughs> okay, okay, Australia, you you really did deliver on your promise to do something new and innovative, um, which was which was great. I I really loved Australia. That it's one of my favourites. Which again, you know, somebody in that room in Australia said, "How about we put them on bendy poles?" And someone else said, "Yeah, right then, yeah, let's, let's try it and imagine what would happen." If they hadn't, because we all got this experience of being able to to see it and be kind of part of that, and yeah, yeah I mean, it was um, it was Kate herself. So originally they had her kind of on the high plinth, and they were just going to have the two sway pole artists, um, okay, who, who were going to be doing the choreography during the swaying. Yeah, and it was Kate herself who said, "No, I'm going to have a go at that." Like, I bet. So she had a go at it. And really loved it, fell in love with doing it and, and really kind of felt an affinity and, and did it really well. And she was like, Well, I'm doing that at Eurovision. I'm not gonna stand on a blimp while they do it. I wanna I wanna swear around the, the the arena in in Tel Aviv. Yeah. So she did. I've got great footage of uh, of that on my phone from being in the rehearsal. <laughs> wow. Oh wow. Like with the rehearsals, do they do like the the full the full thing or or do they have um a kind of a pared down version of it no you get in your first rehearsal you get 40 minutes um which is usually enough time to run the song three or four times because you're running so each song has a maximum of three minutes yeah so in theory you could be able to do it 10 times in that but you can't because you do it once you're then going back looking at things making adjustments changing yeah yeah other things. so there's discussion in between yeah uh, so that's your first rehearsal and then usually about three or four days later depending on the on the schedule you then get your second rehearsal on stage and that's 20 minutes and that's really just to run over all the 
adjustments and things that you've made. So after you've had that first rehearsal, you go to a viewing room where you get to see what it looks like on the television, yeah. um, what's going to go out. That That's where you can make tweaks and you can change things and you can, uh, you know, change up little things. If there's always an opportunity to do that. You can't change anything major at that point, but you can say, actually, put slightly tighter camera there, slightly wider camera, slightly different on this. And, and so there's little tweaks you can make and they're really being made right up until the grand final. In fact, I've made some Q Pilot, which is the program that, that is used to help Q cameras and lighting and, and bring the whole thing together. Yeah. I made some um, Q Pilot videos on my YouTube channel where you can see from even the night before, which is where the juries watch and um, vote, to the live broadcast. And I made some running those side by side so you could see where they've been. Uh slightly differences in camera slightly differences in movement slightly differences in looking into the lens and things like that so I, I find that stuff really interesting as well just how how you finely craft three minutes of music television yeah yeah and we'll definitely put all of that info on the show notes for people because <laughs> I know that there'll be people on that are so excited about just hearing about Eurovision and um, what I loved about our entry um the year before was that actually there was no ridiculous in it actually it was just Sam Ryder and yeah. his voice but it was his voice that was ridiculously amazingly mm -hmm. good and I loved that I was so proud of us for just saying let's just have him sing because he yeah. doesn't doesn't need anything else he's got the hair he's got a great outfit but apart from that his voice is going to do it and Wow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was an incredible force of personality. Yeah. Um, and, and that's really what was needed. Um, yeah. Of course, he then ended up finishing second place. Which yeah. Was, um, yeah. We ended up hosting because Ukraine, for very, very obvious reasons, yes. did not yeah. have hosted um, Eurovision in 2023. So uh, we were in second place. The BBC is, of course, a known, well respected global broadcaster. So it made sense. Uh, for it to to come to the UK, and it absolutely made sense for it to go to Liverpool. What a fantastic, fantastic experience it was in Liverpool. It's very strange driving to Eurovision though, because normally I, you know, I have to fly or whatever. <laughs> uh, but I just took my car up the M5 and the M6, turned left, and I was in Liverpool. It's great. Wow. Yeah, I know quite a few people um, who went, and it, I mean. Yeah, it's a dream come true for so many people because it's in so many different countries and people can't get there. And suddenly uh, it's in Liverpool. I know it's a bit difficult for my hobby who um, works in Liverpool. I <laughs> suddenly found that his <laughs> £60 a night hotel was 850 quid a night. Um, but uh, yeah, amazing experience to be able to have it um, in the UK. Uh, and so, yeah, that's a, that is a phenomenal role in itself Lisa Jane but that is not all that you do is it so tell us uh, some of the other things that you do because I think what well, I mean one of the things that I'm wanting to do is really uh, celebrate International Women's Day and when you when we talked about all the different things you did I was like oh wow this is really inspiring so tell us a bit more about Lisa Jane Lewis and the other things that you do which is I mean I mean, you say inspiring. I say ridiculous. Like it's just that's fine. <laughs> um, I mean, let's kind of stick slightly with the Eurovision world. Sure. Because for, from Eurovision in 2017, I became friends with um the lovely, wonderful, gorgeous Slavko Kalazic, who represented Montenegro. Yeah. Um, he he didn't qualify from the semi-final into the semi-final. Um, but I I started working with him and and became his manager, which I still am today. Yeah. And I think it just it also is a bit of a testament to to him as an artist, but also to the Eurovision community that actually it doesn't really matter how many points you get in Eurovision and whether you qualify, if you're open to what that can bring you, yeah, then there is opportunity way beyond just one stage in one European city for one or two nights. There's so much more that could be had from it. And so from that, I started managing Slavco. We went to Australia for a long weekend. Ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, we did. Yes. <laughs> Doesn't it take a long weekend to get to Australia? Lisa I mean, Jane? <laughs> kind of, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, that, that was insane. 
Um, and then I, I was back in the UK less than 48 hours and I was on a plane to Lisbon for Eurovision in, in 2018. So that was, that was, I always say I went to, I went from London to Lisbon via Sydney and Melbourne. So that was fun. <laughs> Wow, I bet there were a few energy drinks involved in that. <laughs> Honestly, I hit the ground in, in Portugal and I was, I mean, I love traveling. Traveling is one of my absolute passions and, and Eurovision has made me do that as well. Yeah. Um, but I was quite glad that I then wasn't going to be on a plane for sort of 16 days. <laughs> it was quite nice. To 16 like, days, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to be on a plane for a while, which is wonderful. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah, so that... Um, that's kind of happened um I'm trying to think what else you you keep me as to what you what else you want me to do well we about. talked we talked about um the fact that you're a, a minister oh yes of course yes which I mean, is quite a juxtaposition to your official yeah. sub contest broadcaster yeah. well you say that and we'll talk about some of that craziness in just a second yeah but one thing i will say is I would never have imagined when I started doing this Eurovision malarkey um, that actually my Christian faith and like who, who I am and, 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 you know, sort of being a minister or whatever would ever, ever have anything to be involved in that whatsoever. Right. However, people might be surprised. The number of people in press centers and media centers I've had really lovely conversations with, I've prayed with, we've talked about faith, we've talked about people leaving faith, we've talked about people coming to faith. I've it's been incredible and it's something that I would never ever have been able to to predict. I've been there for people when they've had sad news of family and I'm able to kind of switch slightly into into sort of priesty mode only slightly mm -hmm. uh, and, it, and it, it I mean here's a great example of ridiculousness I was with a friend in Liverpool last year I was praying with them in the media center while that finished song cha-cha-cha was booming in the background off the TV. <laughs> well known worship song <laughs> and for some people I think that would be too much for me I'm like that is perfect because faith has to be lived in the ridiculousness of the Eurovision Song Contest, if that's yeah. your context, you know, yeah. it, it can't sit aside in a quiet little private room somewhere. And there's obviously there, there's times when that's appropriate, but actually faith itself gets lived out in in every corner of every part of the world, including press and media centre. Absolutely. Europe. Well, I mean, because life doesn't right. life doesn't stop for eurovision and cha -cha -cha, no. does it so neither no. should faith they run, they run no. alongside each other so yeah, yeah. absolutely and I, you know i've done interviews with um you know christian radio while i've been there i've written calls for thoughts about eurovision that i've written for the church of england newspaper the church times about Eurovision, things like that just because it, it's i think the connection is people and when you get that number of people involved in a project, I and mean, there are thousands of people involved in Eurovision, yeah. when you take in the press and the media who are covering it, you've got the people that are producing the show, you've got the artists, you've got the delegations from all over the place, you've got the fan community. Of course, every faith and none is represented there. So, yeah. you know, it's not, I don't see it as a mission field. I yeah. just consider it a massive privilege that I've been able to be there. The yeah. people at different times what a what a what a joy what a pleasure what an unexpected bonus yeah. of being you know sort of around the Eurovision community as long as I have really yeah yeah <laughs> um, uh, yeah it's wonderful I, I love I love that where do you think where's the most ridiculous place that you shared your faith do you think apart from cha-cha-cha <laughs> <laughs> um I you know, I won't I won't say it about being kind of sharing my faith in that kind of very evangelistic way. Um, but I think I shared with you when we spoke before. I, I basically started my ministry career at the World Trade Center in New York. I used to live in um Boston in the in the USA, in Massachusetts. I worked for the Salvation Army. Um, and in 2001, we all know what happened on September yeah. 11th in New York City. And I then ended up I mean, this really is the most ridiculous thing. It, this makes Eurovision feel perfectly normal. Um, you know, I, I, I 
I ended up being on the on-site chaplaincy team at the World Trade Center in New York as a 24-year-old kind of baby. Wow. Baby part. I was working as a youth pastor in in Boston. And of course, we needed an immense amount of personnel um, in there at yeah. the World Trade Center. Um, and my <laughs> My boss came home from work one day. Um, well, she'd been at a, a meeting in the office in, in downtown Boston. I was back at the core in, in Dorchester, where I lived and where I worked. And she sort of breezed through the door as a sort of buy your leave kind of thing. and said, oh, I put your name down for the World Trade Center. I was like, do, excuse me, do, do, do what now? Like, <laughs> Wow. She was like, well, you're, you know, you'll be fine. You could do it. I was like. Do what? <laughs> what, does, what does that mean? You put my name down to the World Trade Center. And she was like, well, you might not get called, but they they were asking for people who we all thought would be like really good and, and able to kind of do the work there. And I was like, I mean, I think that's sort of a compliment, but also I'd quite like you to ask me beforehand, but no. Yeah. No, that's not how we operated in, in <laughs> where we were. It's like, I put your name down. Um, and I, I think at that point, I really did hope that my name would never come up to the top of the pile yeah. um and it it did and, and pretty soon after that actually so really I didn't have much time to get used to the idea that I was going before I was on a minibus and and the team of us were being driven down to to New York um and that yeah. so uh, you know with all my kind of fun light Eurovision side that's that's not really where it started for me yeah and <laughs> and uh, it, interesting from from both of our point of view being Christian, how many people in the Bible have wanted to say to God, no, don't be ridiculous. I'm not <laughs> the right person to do this. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yet God obviously used you in that way. Um, maybe 24 year old uh, or not. Yeah. Which is yeah. humbling. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think to be honest, like, I've been more used as a result of doing that than probably what I what I was there actually on site because obviously you know you you don't go through an experience like that without it fundamentally changing who you are what you believe what you what your purpose is what you think you're you're doing kind of thing um so for me it really did kind of make a a big difference to the course of my life. It was definitely a a, a gear shift, a, a lane shift. It, something changed at that point, um, and I would never be the same again. Um, which kind of includes everything I've done since, including Eurovision. Isn't it fun to be a little bit ridiculous with Lisa Jane Lewis? If you are enjoying listening to the Rays podcast and inspired by what you hear then please share what we do with other people and also popping us a rating on your podcast platform will really help us with visibility. Thank you so much for choosing to listen to us. Back to the episode. You've certainly done some exciting things. Tell me a little bit about why, because we got talking and you said, you know, I think I can't I don't think I said would you like to do the word ridiculous that would be quite rude wouldn't it I think we were talking and it came out of it you and, are uh, ridiculous said, you want to come and talk about that <laughs> yeah I've been, I've been looking up online and I think ridiculous really no um no we we talked about it and we we said well that you know actually that's a really cool word but what what about ridiculous kind of appeals to you most yeah, I mean, it was me who suggested that word. I think we were bouncing around ideas as to what mm. words we could use. Yeah, and I and I think you know I, I do identify as being a bit ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Everything about me is ridiculous, to be honest. Like, it's ridiculous how I started my sort of career in ministry, if you like. Uh, yeah. Firstly, even before Ground Zero, working with you know young people in gangs in inner city America, I grew up in Surrey. Like, wow. you know, it's it's a completely different world even before that having been on a mission trip in Uganda and having to kind of leave where we were in the middle of the night because the Congolese rebels were coming across the jungle to to potentially kidnap us like that's ridiculous like yeah. then I go and do New York that's ridiculous then I go and train to be a, a 
an officer with the Salvation Army, that's less ridiculous. I suppose that's, you know, <laughs> some <laughs> some normal people do that. <laughs> Almost as soon as I've been ordained and, and sent out, I'm down in Mississippi at Hurricane Katrina making coffee for Laura Bush. Like, what, 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 what <laughs> again, I, all the time I'm doing this kind of thing, I'm like, I just, I'm like this little girl from Guildford in Surrey, like from a nowhere town that just doesn't really do anything, but no one knows Guildford. Well, everyone knows it, but no one's ever been there because. <laughs> um, so all the while I'm doing these kind of things, I'm like, what, what are you doing? This is, this is absolutely ridiculous. Um, so yeah, I suppose when I was trying to find a word that best kind of summed me up, I think I was thinking about it in the more positive, mm. but I but I do use it against myself in the negative as well because I I do think it's just preposterous is another word that one person could have done all this stuff, and I I sometimes question whether people actually believe me, like right. like do people believe that I've done all this stuff or do they think I'm just you know one of those people who makes up kind of fantasy do you remember the 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 sitcom dinner ladies with victoria woods yeah and, yeah and and her mum uh julie waters character uh in it uh, victoria woods mum brenda's mum always had these like crazy stories about like celebrities and people and all these things that she had and they clearly she was just living in a fantasy world and i do sometimes think about that like do people think that i'm like that this isn't true that I live in some kind of weird weird fantasy world the beautiful thing now is you put it all on Facebook so people do know yeah and of course you know, like <laughs> it's got to happen to somebody hasn't it and as we were saying um when we we're talking about wonder and people saying I wonder if you know Victoria Wood and Julie Walters when they wrote Dinner Ladies they'll have had some experience of someone else that said they've done all these things. So people, someone's got to do them. Yeah, they're but I feel ridiculous. like I feel like <laughs> probably all the stuff I've done probably was allocated to four different people and I've just got, no, I'm doing that. Doing that. <laughs> I think I've always had a spirit of saying yes. I mean, unless I can think of any reason not to do it because I might die. Although even that's not necessarily about Well, you did say you might have been kidnapped by a yeah. Congolese rebel, so yeah. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> no, exactly. Um, so, yeah, even that's not really a barrier to it. But, you know, unless I can give a really good reason to say no, I will probably always say yes to things. And I think one of the things in, in the church and just in society in general, we're kind of trying to teach people, you know, you, you can say no to things. You can say no. You don't have to do everything. And I'm like, yeah, but I kind of want to have a go at everything. Mm. I can give you a really great example. So even just a couple of weeks ago, so this has happened since before we chatted, I I spent a couple of days on tour with Pete Jacks, who represented San Marino uh, in Eurovision last year. Yeah. Um, so I've kind of become friends with them and I'm doing a bit to help them out, help them out with their dates in the UK. I drove pretty much... And here's another part of the ridiculous thing and like your life kind of clashing. They borrowed the drum kit from the curate at my old church in Guildford because they needed a drum kit and the venue in Manchester didn't have one. So they were like, do you know where you drum kit? I'm like, well, my friend, you know, who is one of the non-stop entry curates at my old church in Guildford, he was a drummer. I think he still got his kit. So I messaged him and said, can I borrow your kit? He's like, yeah, right there. Wow. So to me, that was just silly. They, they, there they were playing their Eurovision hit on this drum kit <laughs> that I know from my youth used to be the one that was sat at the front of the church, you know, yeah. like, ridiculous. I went straight from there to Yeovil Hospital because my dad had had a bit of an accident. So there I was. I literally like went from the tour with these incredibly talented, beautiful, wonderful humans uh, from Italy. They'd gone on to Poland. I then drove pretty much straight to Yeovil Hospital because my dad had had a bit of an accident with an angle grinder. I won't go into any more detail. Oh, he's fine. Okay. He's fine. Okay, um, good, good. He's had <laughs> surgery and he's fine. Okay, um, wow. I know, silly. Um, during that whole period, I'd had a message that the radio station that I worked for and did all my Eurovision um, broadcasting with was shutting down immediately. So I had that that I was dealing with. I was really sad about that, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I'm on this massive high because I'm doing this tour with, you know, my, my Italian friends and this incredible band and the music is fantastic. I've got that going on in the back of my head. I then 
have found out that I will be involved in the filming of the music video for um, the Irish act for this year coming up. Okay. Um, and that was, that, was, that was in like 48 hours time on from that. Like I literally did like a three months worth of activity in the space of about four days. Like, wow. what is that about? I went into work or went, went into work on the, in the office for one day of that. And I was like, oh, this feels really normal. My office, <laughs> my office I, I work for the Church of England. You know, my, my office is just there and out the window is just the lovely, calm serenity of Gloucester, Gloucester Cathedral. And I was like, oh, this is really lovely. And then before I know it, boom, I'm back doing a video, uh, you know, this music video with someone who's a bona fide witch. Uh, and so we're creating like this, like mad seance in, in a, you know, in the in the in the video and do all this like crazy stuff, and, and it was brilliant, and I absolutely loved it. But there is no other word for it than absolutely ridiculous. Wow! <laughs> oh my goodness! And um, it's all, but I mean, the two things that come up for me are one, it's it's all about your connections. So the more people you're connected to, the more you're going to do, I guess. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is that it feels like there's a lot of courage in it because there's an awful lot of people in the world who are quite happy to say n- no and and even more people that would say I- I'm not I- I'm not even ever going to be asked to do anything like that so why would I entertain it um again in the last episode we, we talked about the world of of yes and it feels like that is very much the world that you live in Lisa Jane that it's a whole load of Yes. Um, and so I I know what you mean by it being ridiculous, but there's so much more to it. It's it's so I think it's very brave and it's taking every opportunity that you've been given, which just makes for a real rich tapestry, doesn't it, of well, life. It does. And I think let me just pick up on those two two kind of words that you said their connection is the most important thing to me. Yeah. I've always said that I'm a <clears throat> excuse me, that I'm a collector of people. Yeah. Like lovely. what I collect in my life is people. Yeah. And you know, the, the dawning of social media, Facebook and Instagram has made that really easy because yeah. I've now got a, a facility by which I can store my collected people, yes. um, which is wonderful. So I know people kind of deride social media and how terrible it is and, and this that, and the other for me it's absolutely brilliant because it, it allows me to to collect those people stash yeah. them up and then stay connected to them so yeah. connection for me is so incredibly important courage is an interesting one I've never really thought of anything that I've ever done as being in any way brave or courageous or anything like that I've just like you said I've lived in the world of yes um and like why why not and I think I do think it comes back to um my work at at Ground Zero actually um because there I was dealing with people who didn't then end up ever having the opportunity to say yes again because they went to work that day and they didn't come home yeah so they never had the opportunity to do that they never had the opportunity to to do anything that was like in their wildest dreams because I think a lot of people have quote unquote normal jobs, um, but they dream about like being a pop star or being yeah, a yeah, yeah. movie thing or working on a you know like something or being a radio broadcaster or you know whatever it, whatever it might be being a footballer being whatever. Um, and I think a lot of people live with unfulfilled dreams or untried dreams. Yeah. Yes. And I and I think for me, I'm like, well, I'm gonna try it out I think I'm I'm lucky in that I'm a creative person anyway so if you give me anything that's involved in any sort of creative thinking or creative practice arty you know visual yeah. stuff whatever, I'm gonna find a way to make it work because that's just who I am yeah so don't give me a football I'm not gonna ever score a goal on a football um so it's it's like good that I put myself in that creative world so that when you just people just get to know who, who you are and what you do and so when things come up you put yourself in the way and sometimes they say yeah you you come and work on my video you come and do this radio show do you want to be a co- commentator at Eurovision in 20 you know for the live grand final yeah yes I do um because yeah. as a 24 year old I was encountering the people themselves but also their loved ones 
who didn't get a chance to say, yeah, I do want to do that. Yeah. So that's not some great, like, you know, social thing, like, oh, I'm doing it for them. I'm not doing it for them, but I'm I'm kind of doing it because yeah. of what I learned from them, which it's is... It's shaped you. It was going to, isn't it? Oh, you can't always. do something like that and then not be impacted. That is ridiculous. Uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. And and <clears throat> sort of the sort of other string to my bow um, the, that I've been doing more recently is education around death and dying and end of life planning. I spoke at Greenbelt last year um, yeah. about that and I've developed a little community organisation that helps people to think about death and dying and make plans for that because that also comes from ground zero um again just meeting the loved ones of folks who went to work that day Mm -hmm. and they'd never had a conversation with their family about anything about whether they want to be buried or cremated they hadn't written a will because they thought well i'm young i don't need to Mm -hmm. make a will you do that when you're old um and actually you no, you don't you absolutely should do that should do that now it took a while I think for my experience at ground zero I say a while I mean like nearly 20 years Mm -hmm. uh for that to mean something I was desperately trying to make it mean something I didn't talk about it for a long long time because Mm -hmm. I hadn't found what it meant um and I'm now writing a, a book I'm writing sort of my story of being there and what that what that meant at the time and and what it's led me to um and the sort of challenges of that that that's thrown up in terms of mental health and in terms of physical health. Um, but I really needed to make it mean something. Mm. Otherwise, it would have been ridiculous to be there. Um, mm. I mean, it still kind of is. Um, but I had to find that that meaning. And for me, with the dawning of the pandemic, the, those two things kind of came together, mm. is that actually what we don't do in our society in the west generally speaking uh, you know i speak about america australia western europe we don't talk about death and dying and mm-hmm. we should and i learned that 20 nearly 25 years ago the rest of the world is catching up with that mm-hmm. to the pandemic not that we want to thank the pandemic for anything but I, it, it did kind of open up those conversations and i thought hang on i'm in a really good position to be able to to help facilitate and 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 make that conversation happen in our society so yeah so i kind of do that as well which means i've done all sorts of other ridiculous things like visit natural burial grounds and watch cremations take place like li- literally the whole thing like it and it's beautiful and fascinating and and equally ridiculous <laughs> yeah i i can't remember what it's called which is annoying but there was a film on netflix and it was one of those that it, it as a rom-com and it just looked a bit throwaway and I wasn't sure about it but I watched it and uh and it was about it was about a girl and a and a guy getting together but the the guy's mum was dying of cancer and Mm. he was going to what the the girl thought was her funeral but actually it was a party before she died to say all the things that she wanted to say uh to everybody it was mm-hmm. a, a party of her dying and it was just wonderful to see it and it really made me think you know yeah I, I think I read something the other day someone was saying you need to say at at parties the things that you you would otherwise be saying at your funeral kind of thing you need to be telling people and saying thank you and and recognizing it all before um, yeah. before you die but again I can imagine people you know who are creating that film writing that film saying that's no nah, that's a ridiculous idea she, she can't celebrate it before she dies but it was so beautifully done absolutely it's, it's, beautiful it's a real thing they're called living funerals I spent three years working in the hospice world I certainly have, have encountered that they're, they're called okay. living funerals and, and a lot of people do them particularly as you can imagine if you've been given a a terminal diagnosis yeah, yeah. That, that, that you're not going to recover from yeah it kind of focuses your mind a little yes. bit I say yeah. that from not from my own perspective but from yeah. working with people in that in that situation it, it focuses your mind and you're like actually i need to feel these people i need to need to tell them i would say to everyone who doesn't have a 
you know, a terminal diagnosis of anything, do it anyway. Not necessarily have the party, but tell your loved ones every mm. day that you love, you love them. them. Yeah, absolutely. Or, that, or thank people for what they've done. Be open yeah. to to hearing, connect. It's, it's just that thing, connect. That could have been connect. the other word. Maybe yeah, it would yeah. be connection. But, yeah. um, you know, be connected to people. Love your friends. I think we don't, I think we say things like, I love you to our nearest and dearest to our, our partners and our children and our, our parents and things like that. But I, we need to tell our friends that we love them and why we love them. Mm. Like uh, that's, I, I, I don't know, bring it back to Eurovision again, but like Eurovision has given me some beautiful people on, in my life. Almost what happens on the stage for me now is sort of a little bit immaterial. Yeah. It's the people that it's brought to, to me, Slavka, who I manage. I love that man with, uh, it, it's like a, a, a soulmate connection that we have. Like we yeah. know when each other is happy or sad. We live, you know, a thousand kilometers away from each other, but that connection is just so strong. And we tell each other that we talk to each other all the time. This mm. new connection with Pete Jacks, I I love them, and I tell them why. Um, and and it's nice when they message back, and do they're just so busy. Um, mm. but not just the people on the stage, people friends in the press center, friends that I've known for years now, we've become a family to each other and we support each other. A friend of mine had um, foot surgery before going to Liverpool, thought that he wouldn't be able to end up coming to Eurovision, to which we said, absolutely not, get a wheelchair. I'll dr- If I have to drive you mm. from home, which is in Stoke-on-Trent, to Liverpool, you know, if I have to do that drive a few times during the week to make sure that you're here and you can keep your hospital appointments, I'll do that because I love you. Yeah. Not in not in that romantic yeah. way, but I yeah. love you. You're my friend, and that's what yeah. we do. Whereas, again, there may be people that say, "Well, that, that that's ridiculous. You can't you can't drive him, or he's got a bad foot. He can't do it." But it's that um, that yeah. going through the putting the person through the roof isn't it so that they can um meet Absolutely. Jesus. it's like you know you go the the extra mile well normally around this kind of time of the podcast we have a challenge but I think that is challenge on isn't it just tell well, tell people that that tell, you love them and don't worry about being ridiculous it, yeah no absolutely and because when you do ridiculous things you you discover and you learn so much absolutely and that that can be on a really really deep level or it can be on the fact that you can fit two bags and a wheelchair in the back of a Vauxhall Tigra two-seat sports car you know it it can be as practical as that or it can be actually I've learned here that this is a person that I'm going to be connected with for the rest of my life and I love everything about them and we're there for each other so yeah the challenge I suppose the challenge is just tell people tell people to love them and tell them why yeah, because I was just going to say, going back to the pandemic, you know, if we'd said mm-hmm. five five years ago, uh, the whole world is going to shut down, yeah. you know, in, in a year's time. Ridiculous. Don't be yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. Of course, of course no, you can't have pubs closing down. Don't be ridiculous. And yeah. There you go. Yes, yeah. it happens. Um, oh, my goodness. This has been just fantastic absolutely fantastic it's been lovely to talk uh about all things eurovision but then all things uh lisa jane as well and the amazing things that you've done um and the way that your embracing of ridiculous has brought so much joy and life and uh encouragement to other people so yeah thank you for being ridiculous and embracing it and owning it um we come to the part of the podcast where I do an on the spot poem and I suddenly realized that I'm meant to maybe try and rhyme the word ridiculous which is I don't think but all poems ridiculous. don't have to rhyme do they no I know it's it's um it's my it's just my thing it's kind of my flow but I don't think it's okay. going to happen so we we'll, let's see what happens eh okay let's see what happens don't be ridiculous Or maybe do, maybe try those things that people have said you don't want to. Be brave and encourage, take strides in the right direction or in another direction that 
you're not sure of yet. Connect, make friends and keep friends and love those people that have come into your life and don't strive, have fun, put that dress on, eat that cake, say yes to the things that other people have said won't work. Enter a world of yes, make them mess and be ridiculous. Hmm, not my best. Oh, I love that one. That was so good. <laughs> um, thank you so much. It's been such a lovely chat. Um, and thank you for taking the time out. I'm assuming you're not off to Australia for the day tomorrow or anything. I'm not going to Australia for the day tomorrow. <laughs> I am just going to go out with a lovely Eurovision friend of mine, Benny, who I haven't seen for many years. We're going to go out for dinner tonight. So I'm really lovely. Cool to him again. Lovely. Thank you so much, Lisa Dane. It's been wonderful. We'll pop all of your bits in the show notes. We'll keep um, an eye out for this book that you're writing. That sounds amazing. Yeah, that's not going to be for a few years. Just no. you know, I'm, I'm just starting on it now. So 2026. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll just yeah, we'll we'll keep an eye out on on all those things that you're doing. And uh, thank you so much for for being with us today. Thank, thank you. you.